This podcast is brought to you by the IIEA, sharing ideas, shaping policy. Uh, good afternoon, um, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to the IIEA. My name is Alex White, and Director General here at the Institute. Um, we're delighted uh, to be joined uh, this afternoon by David O'Sullivan, EU sanctions envoy. And I think it can fairly and accurately be said on this occasion that he needs no introduction to this audience. Um, we're very much looking forward to uh, hearing David reflect on his role as EU sanctions envoy uh, thus far and the objectives of sanctions on Russia uh, following the full scale invasion of Ukraine. So in the normal uh, fashion, David will speak to us for about 20 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A with the audience, both here uh, in the room and uh, online. So if you are watching online, you're welcome. Uh, you'll be able to join the discussion uh, using the Q&A function on your Zoom. Um, and send in those questions as they occur to you, as we always say, rather than waiting until the end. We tend to get a bunch of questions towards the end and we're just watching the clock and we're trying to finish. So if a question occurs to you, occurs to the, if you're watching us online, um, you can pop that in just as soon as it occurs to you. Those of you who are in the room, uh, more than welcome. You can put in your questions in advance, I'm afraid you just have to memorize them and then we'll have a great opportunity once uh, David has finished his introductory uh, presentation. That presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. Uh, you can join the discussion as well on Twitter or X, I should say, using the handle at IIEA. And if you're going to do that, please tag us uh, uh, any posts that you share about the event. Uh, David O'Sullivan took up his role as EU sanctions envoy in January of 2023, leaving a certain vacancy in this organization, which I was uh, pleased to, uh, to fill. Prior to this, he was Director General, as I say, uh, here. Before working in this in the Institute, he was with the Brussels office of the uh, law firm uh, Steptoe and Johnson as a senior counsellor between 2019 and 2022. David served as ambassador uh, of the European Union uh, delegation to the United States from November 2014 until February 2019. And prior to his appointment as ambassador, he was the chief operating officer of the EU's diplomatic service, the European External Action Service. He previously held a number of uh, senior positions uh, within the European Commission, including Director General of Trade, uh, Secretary General of the European Commission itself, and Chief of Staff to Commission President Romano Prodi uh, between 1999 uh, and uh, 2000. Uh, and I think many of you will be aware that David uh, started his career, his illustrious career, I think it may be said, an eventful career with the Department of Foreign Affairs back in 1977. Now, before I introduce uh, David and invite him to address you, I think it is appropriate that we should note the very sad uh, death this week of uh, John Bruton, former Taoiseach, uh, a former e also former EU ambassador to the United States, a post that I mentioned David subsequently held. Uh, John Bruton was an esteemed member of the board of the IIEA, a huge supporter of our activities uh, down through the years. And in particular, I think, uh, as I understand it, although I wasn't here during the period of the IIEA's uh, engagement with Brexit, but he was an especially active and energetic member of the uh, Brexit um, group that we uh, had here within uh, the Institute. And in fact, subsequently, and I am aware of this in the kind of post-Brexit years, if I can call it that, that we're, that we're in, he, was, he continued to be very, very closely engaged um, with uh, the questions of Irish-British uh, relations, the impact of Brexit, uh, the implications of Brexit, right up to the current period uh, in, the, in our UK group here. And he appeared regularly um, on our, Monday, our Friday morning sessions um, as, uh, you know, as engaged and as, as I say, as energetic and as interested as he ever was. As well as being a politician, obviously, uh, a minister, Taoiseach, a diplomat, um, working on, worked on many, I know when I was in government myself, being conscious that John Bruton was working on many initiatives, uh, some sung and some very unsung on behalf of this country uh, internationally. But as well as all of those things, he was also a public intellectual in the truest sense, curious, extremely well informed and genuinely open to all views, despite holding some really unshakable principles throughout his life, as many people will be aware and will appreciate. So we feel a keen sense of loss um, at the IIEA. 
um, as indeed people do across the country, obviously in the Fine Gael party, but across the country. We want to send our sincere and heartfelt uh, condolences to the Bruton family, especially to Finola and their children, and most especially to Richard Bruton, who in fact was in this room only last week, um, uh, in the same tradition as his brother, contributing to a session that we had uh, on the circular economy. So it's a sad moment, but we will remember John Bruton, I'm sure you'll all agree, with great respect and affection. So it's my uh, pleasure now to hand over the floor to our friend, David O'Sullivan, to address you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alex. And just let me um, echo uh, your, your remarks about John. Much, is, much has been said, uh, but he was a wonderful man uh, and a great friend of this institute. Uh, and much has been said about his Irish political career, but of course he was a very committed European did a fantastic job as EU ambassador in Washington. Even I remember being in far-flung parts of the United States and they would say, oh yes, do uh, you remember that Irish ambassador, John Bruton? He always left a strong imprint wherever he went, uh, both for his, his humanity, his friendship. He was a very likable person. But as you say, uh, Alex, and this is really what I remember, is just an absolute font of ideas and thinking and stimulating all the time, and I cannot count the number of times he would ring me up uh, and say, listen, I've just been had an idea, I'm thinking of writing something, what do you think? And he'd go on, and, he, and it would always be very clever, sometimes provocative, didn't always agree with everything he said, but it was, uh, he was a fantastic, uh, always thinking, always the mind, always functioning and thinking a bit out of the box as well. So he's, he's a great loss, and uh, I could only uh, join in in the condolences that you've offered to to his wife and and his children and and all his family. He he will be sorely sorely missed. But I'm I'm glad to be back at the institute. Uh, it's great to be here and see so many familiar places. See the place in such good shape. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about sanctions uh, and the 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 conflict uh, in in Ukraine. Um, I I think it's important. To, I want to talk about a few things. I mean, firstly, why sanctions? I mean, obviously, uh, the, the the proximate reason was, of course, the full-scale invasion of, of Ukraine. But I think it's very, very important to put that in a context that this is not just about Ukraine. This is not about a sort of little local border argument uh, in Ukraine. And we were perhaps collectively guilty of taking that approach to previous crises of this kind. Uh, actually, President Putin set out rather clearly his ambitions for a sort of new Russian imperialism uh, at the Munich uh, Security Conference in 2007. I think people were not perhaps listening as attentively as they should have. Uh, in 2008, we had the war in Georgia, which was already a first sign of Russia's willingness to use military force to pursue a certain agenda. Then, of course, we had the annexation of Crimea in 2014, uh, and we had the uh, disruptive activity and the starting of a war by Russia uh, in, in the eastern provinces of, of Ukraine, a war which went on for eight years before we finally had the full-scale invasion. I, I think the scale of the threat which Mr. Putin's behavior poses to the security of this continent is, is never to be underestimated. This truly is a, a, a debate about who gets to define the rules of the 21st century in Europe. Are we going to have a multilateral rules-based, law-based structure recognizing the sovereignty of states uh, and, and working on some basic principles? Or is it going to be the law of the jungle and who has the biggest army and the most might? That is really what this is about. And there's a very good speech which uh, Vice President, uh, High Representative Borrell gave uh, to the uh, Ukrainian parliament uh, yesterday, I think, uh, uh, which where he sets this out very clearly. So the stakes are enormously high. And while it is about Ukraine and we have to show support for Ukraine, it's the stakes are high for all of us. This really people will look back in 20 years and say, how did they manage that crisis? And either we will come out of it stronger and we will have the, 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 the good thesis will have prevailed or it will not. And that is really how it will be judged. So our reaction when the full scale invasion happened had to be strong. Obviously, it's got three pillars. It's got military assistance and this has been absolutely crucial. It's got macro financial and humanitarian assistance, and it's got sanctions. I want to talk mostly about the sanctions, but of course we should not forget the other two pillars because they are very, very important. 
uh, and uh, the re re remarkable job which the Ukrainian army did in pushing back on the first offensive, frankly, could only have been achieved in large measure due to British, as I understand it, training of the Ukrainian army since uh, since 2014, uh, but also the equipment uh, and the, the, the funding which they've had, including from the European Union. And we've had an unprecedented situation where the European Union is now putting money into uh, armaments and, and military equipment for, uh, uh, for Ukraine's defense. The macroeconomic is, of course, crucial because this is a, a massive shock to the Ukrainian economy. Uh, uh, the, the destruction, the wanton destruction, which Russia is, is, is wreaking on uh, civilian infrastructure uh, and, and uh, capital is, is going to take a long time to rebuild, and it's going to cost a lot. And then, of course, sanctions, because why, why sanctions? Um, we have never had a series of sanctions like this before. And the objective of the sanctions is threefold. Firstly, to deny Russia access to the advanced technology needed to make sophisticated military equipment. Secondly, to deny the Russian government the revenue to continue to fund this war. And thirdly, to impose a high economic cost on the Russian military industrial complex uh, in, in response to the unprovoked uh, full-scale invasion. These sanctions, uh, which started uh, almost immediately with the uh, immobilization of Russian assets and the blocking of Russian banks to the SWIFT system, which disconnects them from the international financial system, <clears throat> have over 12 and soon to be 13 successive packages uh, extended to cover nearly all aspects of our economic and commercial relations with, with Ukraine. Um, we cover about 60% of our imports and about 75% about of our previous exports. Uh, it has covered uh, some 7,500 products, including hydrocarbons, uh, including oil and gas imports. It's important, however, and we've never seen, uh, we've never adopted sanctions on this scale uh, uh, against anyone in the history of, of the European Union. And it's important to understand also what we did not sanction. Uh, this is not a full-scale trade embargo. There was a conscious decision taken by the sanctioning coalition of the G7+, plus. Uh, that we would not actually sanction Russia's continued trade in oil with other countries because we didn't wish to cut the global south off from uh, oil supplies which they needed. The same was true of agricultural and fertilizer. Uh, we also, for humanitarian reasons, did not ban med medicines, pharmaceutical products, or medical equipment. So there are quite a number of exceptions and exemptions uh, which have allowed Russia to continue to trade. I'll come back to the oil price cap in a moment. But these sanctions um, have been very challenging, frankly, for our member states to, to implement. Because previously, if we had sanctions, say, against Iran, the implementation of sanctions was mainly focused on oil. It was mainly run by foreign ministries and deep respect I have for foreign ministries. Um, implementing these sanctions runs deep into the economic and commercial fabric of all of our member states. And as you know, Sanctions are uh, adopted at European level, but are implemented at, at national level. And so the member states have had to mobilize customs officials, police, investigative authorities, prosecutors, uh, ministries of industry, ministries of economics, uh, in order to police the uh, full implementation of these sanctions. And this is going to be a continual challenge because uh, wherever there are sanctions, there is circumvention there are efforts to get around them. There's money to be made through circumvention, and there always will be people who are willing uh, to take a chance on trying to break sanctions or to evade sanctions. So we must understand that we're never going to completely eliminate it. What we have to do is progressively make it harder, slower, and more expensive for Russia to obtain any of these, any of these sanctioned products in order to uh, imp impede their ability to, to pursue, to continue to pursue this war. Now, my role has been uh, to focus on the leakage of products through third countries who are not aligned on our sanctions. What we did was a fairly crude uh, analysis of where trade previously went to Russia, which was now going in unusually large quantities to some other destinations and from those countries to Russia. That was a first list where we thought there were issues of circumvention, potentially. And this threw up a first list, mainly Central Asia, Caucasus, uh, Serbia, uh, 
Turkey, uh, United Arab Emirates were the first countries on the list, and that's where I've spent a lot of my time uh, in the last 12 months is talking to these countries about these issues. Um, it is important to note that two of those countries, uh, Serbia and Turkey, technically speaking, legally speaking, should be aligned on our sanctions as they are candidate countries. They have each chosen for their own good reasons not to do so, but I, I think this needs to be reminded from time to time. Uh, <clears throat> the other countries have chosen not to implement the sanctions because for one reason or another, they don't feel these sanctions, of course, do not have UN uh, approval. They're not adopted by the UN because Russia as a permanent member of Security Council was not going to acquiesce in its own sanctioning. So they are by, by definition and necessarily unilateral sanctions, even though they are adopted by a, a very wide international coalition. Um, and of course, they are backed up by uh, many resolutions of the General Assembly supporting the territorial integrity of, of Ukraine and condemning the, the unjust uh, invasion. But the argument that I have used when I visit other countries is to say that uh, they all say they don't want to be a platform for circumvention. Because this is potentially damaging to their reputation. Many of them are actively seeking foreign direct investment. They don't want to be on the wrong side uh, of the, the, the companies uh, from countries who, who are sanctioning and who would be hesitant to get caught up in, in anything which might look or feel like uh, sanctions busting or sanctions evasion. But also we have made the argument that they don't want to be involved particularly in anything which might have a military application. And we were able to identify it from an early stage with the Ukrainian colleagues, uh, products found in Russian weaponry on the battlefield, found in drones, found in, in, in missiles, found in artillery shells, uh, mainly uh, low, I would say low, low advanced tech, stuff which is fairly commonly used in civ with civilian application, but which we know when it goes to Russia, it's going to end up in missiles or, 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 or drones or artillery shells. And this was a list of some 45 uh, tariff lines, uh, which we were able to identify uh, and which we have asked countries not to re-export from their countries. And we have been able with some success, I think, to persuade countries that they will not allow the re-export of these products on their territory. And that has been uh, a primary focus uh, for, for, for some time. Uh, we, of course, have other products where we need to we need to work as well, uh, uh, including uh, we will probably lengthen that list to include numerically controlled uh, machines, machine tools, because we've discovered that these can be used to make the very things that uh, go into the weapons. So uh, this is uh, one of the well, now the other the other thing I want to say is that from the list of countries I first gave you. It's clear that we have had a good deal of success in cutting off the flow, but we now observe new channels uh, of, of circumvention which arise uh, uh, with other countries uh, popping up in the statistics, and we will continuously be working with these countries uh, uh, to address this issue of circumvention. Um, Commissioner McGuinness next week will convene the member states' national competent authorities, the the authorities of member states responsible for the implementation of sanctions in the afternoon. I will bring together uh, the coordinators of the international coalition, particularly with our US and UK colleagues uh, who are very active. Uh, and we will discuss how on the, as we approach the second anniversary of this horrible war, uh, how we can continuously uh, improve and uh, uh, make more effective uh, the implementation of sanctions. You may have seen that uh, Commissioner McGuinness and Vice President Dombrovskis in, in the run-up to that meeting have written to member states uh, yesterday. We need to do more domestically. This is not a criticism of member states. It's just an, an observation that when I travel to third countries, in many cases, they say, well, that's very interesting, Mr. Sullivan. But I mean, it's your companies that are exporting this stuff. Now, that's a little unfair because in many cases, our companies are in good faith, think they're exporting to one place and then it ends up in Russia. But there is much more that I think we can collectively do at home to reduce uh, circumvention, to reduce the, the uh, possibilities that goods are actually diverted. In the last package, we asked our companies to introduce a no Russia clause in the resale of any of these products, no matter where they're sold, it should say that they may not be resold to Russia. Uh, I think companies need to do much more due diligence 
of asking where has it where has this o o order come from uh, and if you know is it if it was a company that was created in february 2022 doesn't appear to have much of a track record in trading you might ask yourself some questions you might like to get some additional information so i think there will be a continuous need uh, on our side to uh, increase and 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 improve our ability to identify at source the risk of circumvention which of course we will still work with third countries uh, we will still push third countries uh, not to allow themselves to be used as a platform but at the end of the day uh, these products are our products they're european they're american they're british they're uh, of other manufacture and we need to uh, all the time come back to to the what's happening domestically in this, of course, we have the issue of the oil price cap. We allowed uh, Russia to continue to trade, to sell oil, but in order to reduce the revenue available to uh, uh, the Russian government, we set a, a price cap of $60 a barrel. Uh, and the enforcement of this was that you could not ship it, you not get insurance for shipping uh, this oil unless the price cap is being respected. It worked very well for the first half of last year. To be honest, it has been slightly less effective in the second half because we've seen two innovations. One is uh, the creation of a shadow fleet. This is a uh, Russia basically acquiring end of life vessels uh, and ensuring it in some way that is not entirely clear and continuing to ship the oil on that basis in a sort of uh, maritime dark web, if you see what I mean. Um, this is deeply worrying because, frankly, these vessels are often in bad condition and we're not entirely sure what the insurance is worth. So if it were to crash uh, on a coast somewhere and there was to be a massive oil spill, it's not entirely clear whether there would be any money there to clean up afterwards. Another trick is to understate the price of the cargo and increase the overstate the price of the oil. So this is a sort of formal attestation that tankers have to have about how much uh, what's the cost of the transport? What's the cost of the, of the content? So these are areas where the G7 is working again. Uh, we took measures already in, in the 12th package, uh, and we will take further measures. But the fact is that Russian revenue from oil and gas is considerably reduced uh, uh, since the war began. Uh, it will never be completely eliminated. We have to be clear because we have chosen to allow it to continue to flow for, for good reasons of relations with the uh, global south. Um, let me now touch briefly on the issue of the impact of sanctions. Um, this is much debated. Uh, I'm an economist by training, though a long time ago, but I never believed that economics was a science. I always thought it was much closer to an art. Um, but there are differing economic views. My, my personal conclusion is that the sanctions are very definitely having a deep and negative effect on the Russian economy, structurally. The problem is that it is more a slow puncture than a blowout. And there's a war going on and people are dying every day in Ukraine. And so we would, we would have liked a blowout. But what we have is a slow puncture. But it is a slow puncture where the air is escaping ineluctably from the tire and sooner or later, it is going to become impossible to drive the vehicle. This requires us to be extremely diligent and double down on the sanctions and on making the sanctions work. Uh, this is not a moment to lose our nerve or to think because some of the growth figures coming out of Russia look good, that sanctions are not working. What is happening in Russia is uh, the transformation of a previous civilian economy into a war economy. 30% of Russian government spending is now going to the military. Military expenditure in Russia is close to six, seven, eight percent of GDP. If you cannibalize your economy and you basically sacrifice all the productive parts of your economy, social welfare, education, uh, uh, research, and you put it into the unproductive military sector of producing tanks and weapons, of course, you will get growth but it's not, it's not solid, reliable growth. And you are actually eating away at your ultimate potential and, and, and future growth. And this is what's happening to the Russian economy. Uh, Russia, we, we estimate that Russia has been denied about 400 billion 
uh, euros, including the 200 billion uh, central bank assets that have been frozen in Europe and uh, uh, others immobilized in other parts of uh, the world. Uh, the revenue is down uh, and the what was previously a very healthy surplus in the Russian economy is now a, a deficit. So there has also been a massive uh, brain drain exit of some of the best and talented people. Whenever I travel to Astana or Tashkent or Bishkek, uh, in all the coffee bars, you see young Russians, some of the brightest and best IT people working away on their computers, all setting up startup companies, uh, probably making a life for themselves outside of Russia. They will never go back. Uh, so there's there's a brain drain at the uh, at the higher end of the labor market, but there's also uh, a shortage at the lower end because of the mobilization and the many uh, tens and tens of thousands of, of young people who've been forced into the military uh, and who are no longer available to work uh, in 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 the more menial kind of jobs. So the, there's a massive labor market squeeze. Now, none of this is to say that sanctions are the only answer or that they are a silver bullet that will solve the problem. I want to come back to my beginning, the three things, military assistance, financial assistance, and the sanctions. We need all three. Uh, it's great that we have managed in Europe to reach agreement on another financial package. I sincerely hope that the Americans uh, can find agreement uh, on further military assistance. We will have to do more on military assistance. Uh, it is, for me, kind of strange to see that we're actually talking about bullets artillery shells. I mean, this is not high tech uh, warfare. This is just do people have enough of the sort of rudimentary elements that you kind of remembered from old war movies uh, from another era. But that's what it's down to, unfortunately. And here, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, particularly here, here in Europe. We need the financial assistance, but we also need the sanctions to work, to continue to push, to continue to squeeze. We will have another package uh, this uh, next week, uh, again, in the run up for the second anniversary. Uh, and we will be asking when Commissioner McGuinness convenes the, the member states to for member states to really improve and continue to work on the domestic implementation of this package, because this is hugely important. The, the adoption of sanctioned packages is quite sexy. People like to have the fanfare. The hard work is actually you know, it's the customs officials, it's the tax officials, it's the, the, the prosecutors, the, the investigative police, every day going out there and looking at what's happening on the ground. That's what makes sanctions work. It's the, the task of trying to persuade third countries to make it more difficult, to make it slower, to make it more expensive for Russia to, to break these sanctions. And, and I think this, the stakes here are so high that you know, I, I, I never forget when I'm doing this job and I'm only doing one small part of, of a, a remarkable job done, I must say, by, by the commission staff on this, uh, that it's, it's an obligation and a historical moment where everyone has to do their bit and all the small bits and pieces that you do across the full range of the sanctions, whether financial sanctions or sectoral sanctions or uh, the hydrocarbon sanctions, this is all a, 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 a contribution to a struggle which really is about what kind of world do we want to live in for the rest of this century. And I don't believe that we can allow Mr. Putin to be the one to define that. I think we have to be the ones to define it. And support for Ukraine is essential to our being able to do that. Um, I'll stop there uh, as by way of introduction. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by the IIEA. Sharing ideas, shaping policy.